Hello, I'm Dennis Tucker. I'm a preacher of Lyle Grove Church of Christ. And I wanted to give you a lesson, a talk, uh, present a lesson at this time called Perfect Silence. Perfect Silence. Then other night, now I'm not really a big fan of America's Got Talent. I, for whatever reason, I never I'm very get involved in that show. But I've kind of learned that if I am curious about something or, or if I want to see a little part of it, the best time to really turn it on is generally in the last 20, 30 minutes of the show. And that's when you'll really tend to get the better of the, the acts of people trying to, to get on America's Got Talent. And as I turned on, the last person I saw the other night was a young lady by, and her stage name is Nightingale. Excuse me, Night Birdie. That's, that's her stage name. And when she walked out there, you could tell that she was pretty thin, had short cut hair, and basically uh, walked out and, and, of course, got the usual greeting of people cheering her and then a few questions about her. And, and as the conversation went on, it, it became known that she is a person that has cancer. Uh, for the last year, she has been battling cancer. And they asked her how she was doing, and she said she was okay, but... Then she revealed that she had cancer in her lungs and in her spine and in her liver, which means that really she's not okay, uh, as we normally think of it. But she wanted the people to know that she was okay. And in fact, she sang a song, and it's titled, I'm Okay, a self-written title, a song by her. But what I noticed was she has a really good voice. I mean, a really uh, good voice. But what I noticed about the performance was really the reaction of the judges and of the audience. And that is that there was not a sound. I went back to the video and looked at it again. And from the moment she started singing to the moment she ended, there was not a sound in the whole place. In fact, I, I went back and I counted the number of seconds from the end of the song to when you got a reaction to the crowd. Now, usually crowds react either one or two ways, and that is of disapproval if they don't like the act and they think that shouldn't be on there. Or the second is, a lot of times, of approval and encouragement. But in this case here, there wasn't either one. And I do mean it was completely silent. I've heard that described as being the perfect silence. And that is, after about four seconds, then the crowd erupted in cheers. And the judges were very emotional about the reaction to her song, about her story. In fact, she wound up getting what they call the golden ticket, where she bypasses a lot of the preliminary uh, trials they go through, and she goes straight to the live shows. But I got to think about that idea of the perfect silence. Now, perfect, when we use the word perfect, what we mean is that is as good as it can be. There's nothing wrong at all about it. And silence, we understand that there's not a sound. Now, silence can be very, a, a way of uh, communicating. In this case here, it's a way of communicating. A lot of times, the most authentic form of communication is actually by silence. Uh, maybe a couple that are in love, that they don't have to actually say anything. They can tell by May the way they look at each other, may the way they gesture each other, their facial expressions, that they're communicating to each other. It's the same as if somebody's angry. Generally, you walk into a room, if somebody's angry, we don't have to ask them, are you angry? We usually can pick up on their anger by, again, the same things, their facial expressions, their body language, uh, their eye contact, or if they have eye contact with us. And as you think about this, silence can be very powerful. And that is, it can show approval and show disapproval. It can show anger, it can show great emotion. And silence then is a very powerful thing. And, and there are times as much that we look at that there's a proper time to speak and a proper time to keep silent. And in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 7, the wise writer said, A time to tear, a time to, to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. Yeah, there are times, obviously, when Communication by words are necessary, are important. Over in Jude, the third verse, he said, Beloved, I, while I was very diligent and write to you concerning our common salvation, 
I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all due to the saints. Now, when I read that, and then it says contend for the faith, that what does that mean? Uh, that means they had to be willing to speak out, that when false doctrines were being taught, when things were being said that was not right, then they had to be willing to communicate that, to speak up. But again, there are times to be silent. And we are told in times that, that we need to watch how we say and what we say. In James 1, verse 26, it says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one religion is useless. And so there are times you have to bridle your tongue. Basically, relate what way says there, and put a harness on it. Stop yourself from saying things. And so I thought about, when are some times for the perfect silence? Now let me give you a few, some of these here, right here. One is, when you are tempted to say something that contradicts the Word of God. And over in Psalms 141, verse 3, it says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The Jews took the word of God, and the problem was, partly the problem was, that they contradicted it by their own teachings. They had the word of God, they had the law of Moses, but then they actually contradicted it. And we find various passages where Jesus called them out on this. In Matthew 15, verse 8, and there Jesus said, These people draw near me their mouth, and honor me their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they, te- they worship me, teaching the doctrines of, and the commandments of men. And so they taught something that was not in the Word of God. They contradicted the Word of God by their teaching. And there's number of things that when you go through it, you find that Jesus, again, calls them out on it. Uh, one was to honor your father and mother. Now, obviously, in the Ten Commandments, that's one of the commandments there. You shall honor your father and mother. But then the Jews took that commandment, and they contradicted it. If you look over Mark 7, verse 10, it said, Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who loves, curses his father and mother should be put to death. Now, that seems to be pretty simple, right? Pretty plain. But then verse 11, but you say, and here's the problem, you see, but you say, here's the contradiction. If a man says to his father and mother, what a prophet you might have received from me as Corban, that is a gift of God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So they need the commandment of honoring father and mother, but by their interpretation, by their application of it, they really just bypassed the whole idea and said, I don't have to do that if I decide to simply say, I'm going to give this to God instead. God didn't say do that. God said, honor your father and mother. Another one is to love your fellow man. When Jesus asked what's the greatest commandment, we find his answer was, I shall love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, and soul. But he said, the second one is like unto you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that way again, that's based on the Old Testament. Now he's answered them on that basis there. But you find that they had various ways of interpreting that, and Jesus called them out on it in Matthew 5th chapter, verse 43. It said, be heard, they have said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And so their way of interpreting a love your neighbor was, okay, let's also contradict that by saying, but my enemy, I can hate that person. Now, here's the problem. You see, where in the law does it say, love your neighbor, hate your enemy? Hmm. I thought about that. I can't find it. I can't find where it says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. They had simply contradicted it by their tradition, by their application of that. And so there's oftentimes people today will have the word of God on certain subjects, and then they contradict it. For instance, on salvation. What must I do to be saved? I can turn the book of Acts. I can start to Acts second chapter. And I can see when that question was asked, and Peter said that you should repent and be baptized for remission of your sins, in Acts 2, verse 38. I can go all the way through the book of Acts, and I can find various cases where they told, were told to repent, and that the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 chapter confessed Jesus Christ and baptized, 
I can find passages where Saul Tarsus believed and he was baptized for remission of sins. And so I can find all these passages that talks about a person must believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, uh, be willing to repent of their sins, confess Jesus, Son of God, and be baptized for remission of sins. And yet there are all times people that look at that and say, but that's not what we have to do. And what they would say, what a lot of people today are saying, is just one of those things, maybe faith on. That believe in Jesus and accept him as your Savior and you're saved then. Why is it they were never told that in the book of Acts? They weren't, I can't find that in the book of Acts. I, well, I find in the book of Acts, everybody has said that they were baptized. Now, it's not baptism only, but they were baptized. And so what they've done is they contradicted the word of God. Now, another example of this is on such a marriage, divorce, remarriage. The Jews had this question. They came to Jesus and basically they asked him, Matthew 19 chapter, was it lawful for men to divorce a wife for any reason? Their interpretation, see, the Bible talks about that over in Deuteronomy, 22nd chapter, 24th chapter deals with the subject. And their interpretation of that was you got to divorce her for any reason at all. And so Jesus answers them in Matthew 19 chapter, verse 4 through verse 6. And there he said, he answered, said to them, Have you not read that he made them beginning, made them male, female? So he goes all the way back to Genesis, the very beginning of mankind, and said, For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, he joined his wife, and two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, God is joined together, let not man separate. Now he goes ahead and explains that the, in case of where one party commits adultery, then the other party has the uh, opportunity, if you would, to put that person away. And as you look at that there, now th that's very simple. And that is that God did not attempt marriage to get divorced, but if that did happen for the cause of adultery, then the innocent party can get married. The other party cannot. But you know, there's a lot of people that will set that on their head and simply contradict that. I remember one time going to a, a, a study, if you would, a, a couple that uh, the congregation had, and they were in an unscripted relationship. And I went there with another member of the church, uh, actually a couple more members of the church, and, and was going over their situation, explaining these passages to these people. And, and then finally one of the men who had been very quiet uh, finally spoke up and said, well, I just want you to know that all, not all of us agree with that. Now, he didn't explain why that wasn't so. He did not explain why what we were saying was false. What he simply did was say, you know what? I don't think that's what you have to do. And what he did was he contradicted what the Word of God said. If he really thought that that was wrong, what we was teaching, he should have pointed out to us. But instead, somebody said, I think it's wrong. He contradicted the Word of God. We should be quiet. And when we are tempted to contradict the Word of God, the Bible says what it says. A saying is, when God says nothing, it's to be silent on that subject. There are a lot of times that the silence of God is very important. And let me give you an example of that. That the silence of God is used to affirm the change in the law of Moses to the law of Christ. Over in Hebrews 7, chapter verse 13, verse 14. And this is talking about Jesus being the high priest today and being from the tribe of Judah. And verse 13 says, For he of whom these things spoke belonged to another tribe, not the Levitical tribe, to another tribe, for which no man is officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, which tribe most concerned nothing concerning priesthood. And so he said, You know what the law most said about Judah being a priest or somebody from the tribe of Judah being a priest? Nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. That is important here because if Jesus is high priest, then it's not by the law of Moses. It has to be by another law. And that's the point the Hebrew writer makes here. The silence of the scripture meant something right there. And there's a lot of things God never talks about, never says, and that means something. For instance, God never said, do not use instrumental music. Now, some people, as you look at it, and, and on the subject, I'll point out to you that in Ephesians 5, verse 19, it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And you know what? A lot of times people look at that, 
And they say, it doesn't say not to use instrumental music. It does not say they should not use instrumental music. What God did say was singing and making melody in your heart. That's what God said. That's what the inspired writer said here. He did not have to say all these other things. He did not have to say, don't use a piano, don't use a guitar, don't use a flute, don't use a banjo. He did not have to say those things. All he had to say is what we are to use. God never said, okay, don't use peanut butter and coke on the Lord's Supper. What I find is God said about unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and here Paul talked about the Lord's Supper when Jesus instituted it in Matthew 26, chapter, verse 24 through 26, if you want to go back and read that. But 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, said, When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat this my body, which is broke for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same man, he also took the cup at the supper, saying, The cup is a new cup of my blood. Do this, do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What I find is Jesus used unleavened bread and fruit of the vine to represent his body and his blood. Now, he did not have to say, don't use anything else. Simply specifying that and remaining silent and everything else meant that's what he wanted us to use. And so a lot of times people say, well, you know, God didn't say I can't do this. What did God say? What did God say? That's what some we need to look at. What did God say? And, and because the everything that we need to be do to be saved, God has said to us. And Second Peter one verse three, as the divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, all things that pertain to life and godliness, everything I need to know has already been revealed to me. And therefore, it's not said, it means I don't have the authority to do it. Another case, a third one. When God says to be silent. When God actually says, you need to be quiet. Let me give you an example. The book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk in the Old Testament, verse 20. It's like a chapter, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now, Habakkuk here had a problem because looking around his nation of Israel and Judah, and his people are saying that these people are really involved in sin and wonders why God isn't doing something about it. And God tells them, I am. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans here to destroy this nation. And Habakkuk turns around and starts saying, hold it here, God. They're more unrighteous than we are. They're more wicked than what we are. And that's when God said, you need to be quiet. The Lord is his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. You see, we should not try to argue and debate God. Have you ever gotten in yourself that position? Where you start reading the Bible and you start saying, yeah, but, and start arguing with God himself. Now, God does not need our spiritual approval. When I think about, in the Old Testament, one example of that is that God is specified to the priesthood where they were to get the fire. And a well-known case of violation of that is on Leviticus 10 chapter. The sons of Nadab and Bayou. In Leviticus 10 verse 1, it said, Then Nadab and Bayou, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put a sand sense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. In other words, he had not said anything about this fire right here. So the fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died for the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, but those come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and out there before all the people, I must be glorified. But notice the next words. So Aaron held his peace. Aaron stayed silent. After all, what can Aaron say? What can I, how could Aaron argue with God? God just did this. God has specified why he had, had done this to them. And so... Aaron is a position he really couldn't say anything to God. He couldn't argue with God. Now, there may be things in the Bible I read about and see, and, and I may not understand exactly why God said that, or why, why God said to do it this way, or why God said to do it that way. But, you know, it's not up to me to argue with God. Let me give you an example today. One of the big subjects, and I think it's going to become a, a bigger one here in the, in the future again, is women as 
the elders of the congregation, as uh, preachers, as teachers that are overseeing and usurping authority over men in the classes. And as you look at the Bible, you know, the suggest today to people that women really shouldn't be preaching in the position of ex you know, usurping, exercising authority over men, uh, men of the congregation. They shouldn't be in position of, of oversight of being the elders of the congregation. Uh, again, a teaching classes. And to say that, there's a lot of people that would say, I don't believe that. I, I don't think that is right at all. But what did God say? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are being submissive, as the law also says. They are to be silent. Now, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, chapter deals with the miraculous use of gifts. And, and he says, in that situation, they are to be silent. Now, 1 Timothy 2, verse 11, you know, says, let a woman learn a silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man, but be in silence. For Adam was formed first and Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, he gave a reason here in 1 Timothy 2, verse 11, but notice why he said, not to usurp authority, not to exercise authority over a man. Now, again, I may not like that. Somebody may argue and say, there are women that are really good scholars of the Bible. There are women that are really good communicators and can really do a job of talking about the Bible. And how dare you say that they cannot exercise authority over man. You need to be silent. God said the women need to be silent. That solves it. It's not a matter of women's lib or being anti-woman. It's only a matter of God said this. Let all the earth keep silent. God said I've spoken. Be silent. And so it's not just a a like or dislike what God says. When God says something, we ought to be silent and let his word stand for itself. But let me give you the last one here. We don't know what to say. When we really don't know what to say, it's best to keep silent. There's all saying that silence is golden. You know, and, and that's true. And in many cases, that silence is sometimes the best thing we can be. Job's friends came to him at, to comfort him. And really, the first couple of chapters is pretty good as far as the friends coming to comfort Job. But when they start speaking, that's when things go downhill. To a point in Job, the 13th chapter of 5 says, Oh, that you be silent and it would be your wisdom. You know, you're better off just being quiet. What are you saying to him? Better off you just hold your peace. Don't say anything. Proverbs 28, excuse me, Proverbs 17, verse 28. Said, even a fool is counted wise and he holds peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perspective. The person there and just being quiet, and people think, man, that's a deep thinker. Maybe it's just a case that he doesn't know what to say and he has enough wisdom not to speak. He said, that, that, there's a lot of truth to that. Just be quiet. A good listener has his advantages. So, uh, there's times uh, I've been, you know, I listen to conversations and people at the end of it they'll thank me for being such a good listener. And, and, and that's easy to be a good listener. And so listen. A lot of times, and be silent. It's the best thing you do. A good example of that is Peter in the New Testament. Peter, on uh, Mount Transfiguration. And read about that in Matthew 17, chapter when Peter, Andrew, excuse me, Peter, James, and John are up there on the holy mountain and they see Jesus uh, is transformed and, and starts shining. And there's Elijah, Moses. And, and, and in a loose account, at the end of this, Peter speaks up. In Luke 9, verse 33, no serious said, But it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here, and let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And notice the last part, not knowing what he said. Does that mean Peter did not actually literally know that he just said that? No, what I meant was Peter didn't know, know what to say to this, so he said, okay, let's build three tabernacles. And he found out that wasn't what Jesus wanted. It had been better off to just stay silent. And so being quiet is a lot of times better than, again, playing God. I've learned that going to funerals and times of tragedies, that people often would ask questions and 
want to know things like why this happened or, or doesn't God care? And a lot of times, the best you can do, at least at that moment, is just be quiet. Don't try to play God. Don't try to explain everything at that moment. And so, you know, time of silence is good. I hope this may be helped as far as the perfect silence. When it's, when it's really good to be silent. There are times to speak up and time to be silent. And we always had to have the wisdom to know which one is which. In one case I, I can read about in Acts 8 chapter in the, with the Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 verse 35. It said, Then Philip opened his mouth and began to scripture preach Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, he, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with your, all, all your heart, you may. And the answer said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chair to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down the water, and he baptized him. You see, that's the way the people were saved in the book of Acts in the first century by the apostles, through the blood of Christ. And we need to do that today. We need not, not argue with that, what the Bible says. I appreciate you watching. If you can, come be with us at Lyke Road. Our building is located at 1687 Lyke Road, Woodsville, Kentucky. On uh, Sunday mornings, we have Bible classes at 9.30, worship at 10.25. And then uh, at uh, 5 p.m., we have worship. On um, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we have Bible classes again. And we can age in any way, answering questions. If you feel, feel free to share this with anybody, and also hit the like button. And I appreciate you watching. Hope you have a good day.